Um, so we're going to jump back into Ruth this morning. I want to encourage you to continue to read the book of Ruth. If you're thinking, I feel like I've read the Ruth a hundred times, you probably haven't read a hundred times yet, but please keep on reading it because as you expose yourself repeatedly to the scriptures like that, as you continue to go again and again and again to those same smaller sections of scriptures, those, scripture, those truths go deeper and deeper in you. I want out of this series that one of the things that I would pray for is that as a body, we just know Ruth inside and out. We know the story, we know the elements, we know the big picture themes and all of that. I would love for that to be what we get out of this series. So we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2 this morning, starting in verse 20. And let's pray here and ask the Lord to open our minds. Lord, when you were with your disciples after the resurrection, you opened their understanding so that they could get the scriptures. We pray this morning by your spirit, you would open our understanding so that we could understand the word that we're going to read. Thank you for giving us your precious, immovable word. We stand upon it. We want to, we want to live in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was, uh, because it's been a couple weeks, I re-listened to the last message in this series. I listened to myself, which is always an odd, strange experience anyway, to listen to yourself uh, speaking publicly. And I realized in listening that I had spent 10 minutes of the last message that you heard from me a couple weeks ago recapping the entire book of Ruth from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way up to the point where we were. And I think it's the teacher part of me. It's like, I want everybody to get all the points. So we just keep re-saying it. Well, I'm not going to do that this morning. But we, we are going to pick up for where, just in terms of a recap really quickly, where Ruth and Boaz meet for the first time. It's in chapter 2. They have this extended interaction. It's basically the bulk of chapter 2 is them talking back and forth together. And here's the... Here's the, the summary, the quick summary. Ruth is out making, um, making use of the time and space that she has. She's harvesting some grain. She's trying to take care of herself and her, um, and her mother-in-law. Boaz sees her. He inquires about her. He finds out that she's the Moabite that came back from Moab with Naomi, and they have a conversation. And out of that conversation, he begins to bless this gal. He kind of arranges things so that she'll be extra fruitful. As a matter of fact, the scripture says at the end, in the, towards the end there of chapter 2, that she, on that one day, she harvested an ephah of barley, which is three-fifths of a bushel. I'm not an agricultural guy, so I kind of have a picture in my mind of what a bushel looks like. It's a bath, like a basket and apples. That's what comes to my mind when I think of bushel. I was reading just this past week trying to get more clarity around what that was. This gal walked home that day with somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds of barley. So we don't know how big of a person Ruth was, but if she was a little gal, and she could have easily been not a very big gal, she might have had a big old, like I'm thinking feed sack size, you know, she comes in the door and no, it makes you think, no wonder Naomi said, where did you work today? And she said, I was in this guy's field named Boaz. And then of course all the lights go off for Naomi once she realizes where her daughter-in-law has been working. Look with me starting in verse 20. This is right after Ruth says to Naomi, I worked in the field of Boaz. It says, And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall have... Uh, you, let's try this again. This, and Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men during, uh, until they have finished the harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. Verse 23. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Naomi hears the, the, the name Boaz and she, the, all of the, you know, the flags go off in her brain, all of the electricity. It's like, oh my goodness, Boaz, we're connected to him. He, she specifically says he's, being, he's showing kindness to the living and the dead, the living being Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth by providing this amazing first day harvest for them, but also the dead in that she, he is being kind to her in connection to his relative Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, who is no longer living. And then Naomi says, he is our, he is our redeemer, our close relative. It says in the, the New International Version, says he is our kinsman redeemer. New Living Translation says he is our family redeemer. 
This is an important part of the book, so let's just take a moment and talk about what that means. If someone is a a kinsman redeemer, a family redeemer, that person is a member of the family, a member of the blood family who has the right to purchase property so that land would not be lost outside of the tribe. Now, when we think of property rights, especially a place like the United States, if you have a house or a piece of land or something and it has a a mortgage on it, or if you own it and you can't pay the taxes on it, or you can't pay the mortgage on it, it it will eventually be taken from you, and anybody can own it, in theory. In ancient Israel, nobody owns the land. When God brought Israel into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, the, the book of Joshua talks about how they distributed the land based on the size of the tribe, in the area that they were inhabiting. So when you, when you go in your Bible and you look at the little funny maps that are in the back, and one of them will say like the 12 tribes of Israel, and they'll usually be different colors, and they're all different sizes and they're different areas, it's because that's what God allotted for them. But the land belongs to God. Israel belongs to God at this time. And so each of the clans, each of the tribes had to keep all of the land. And so if someone wasn't able to to take care of their land, it wouldn't be like someone from another tribe could come in and buy it and take it away. It had to stay within the tribe. And these, these relatives, these redeemers, were the people who basically had first dibs on the purchase. But they also had... Uh, first dibs, if you want to say it that way, mean that respectfully, to marry any widows who are connected to that land. In this case, it would make Boaz the first in line, or he actually becomes the second line, as we see there's someone closer to him, to marry this woman, Ruth, so that not only is the land kept within the family of the tribe, but also the bloodline is continued for future generations. So in the Levitical sense, in Deuteronomy, it talks about if a brother has a wife and his, the brother dies, the wife is to be remarried by another one of the brothers so that the family line can continue. As a matter of fact, it says, so that the, the uh, brother can raise up a brother for his deceased brother. He was actually supposed to name the child that would be born after the brother that died. In this case, Elimelech uh, and, and Boaz are not brothers. They are distantly related. So there's not a compulsion for him to marry. Ruth, or to buy this land, but it is an opportunity for him to do so. He is the family redeemer. Look with me in chapter 3, first five verses. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Verse 2, Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Verse 4. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Verse 5. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Naomi gets assertive here. So there's probably a gap in time between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Not exactly sure. It could have been that they they had done both harvests. It says that they were together between the barley and the wheat harvests. And then at at some point later, they were taking and actually doing the threshing of the wheat, of, of the barley. It also could mean that it was in a closer proximity in time. But either way, Naomi comes up with this plan. And Naomi says, I want you to basically basically get yourself um, dolled up. Make, you know, kind of make yourself look really nice. What's another way of saying that? How do we say that? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Yeah, let's stay away from that. (laughs) Kind of just, you know, basically, whatever you do, you know, it's like, she doesn't say this, but it's like, go put your best dress on, go put your best makeup on, go put your best hairdo on or whatever. It doesn't say that, but you know what I mean? That's the idea. It's like, you need to look the best you can look. And then it says, put on a cloak. I, I read in a, one commentary said that may have been to disguise that she was a woman because they're not supposed to have a woman at the threshing floor. We'll see that next week. But, but it also could have been like your nicest clothing. Go down there and, and don't, you know, kind of secretly, secret, <laughs> go down there secretly and look around and make sure nobody sees you. And when he lies down, go over to him and uncover his feet. We'll talk about that next week. And, and lay down and he'll tell you what to do. The thing I want you to see out of this is Ruth's response in verse 5. She replied, all that you say, I will do. She's just, this is Ruth's thing. 
obedience. It's like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Naomi gives her this directive, and she says, fine, I'm going to go get done up. I'm going to go do my hair. I'm going to go put my makeup on. I'm going to go put the nice dress on, and I'm heading down to the, to the threshing floor. Earlier in the book, when Ruth came back from Moab, she just went out to try to find food. She was just being busy. She was being um, occupied with that which is in front of her because there was a need for food. She's out in the field. She's not trying to attract attention to herself. She's certainly not out there trying to gain a husband. She's, she's, known, she's a known quantity in Israel because of the treatment of, of Naomi. She had a reputation in a positive sense. But Ruth's not resting on the fact that she was nice to her mother-in-law in the past. She gets there in town. They need food. She goes out and she begins to do this gleaning process that we've been talking about. She's busy with what needs to be done right now in front of her. And Boaz observes her and he, and he understands who she is once he asks some questions. And, oh, she was kind. And so I want to be kind to her. And we talked a couple of weeks ago. Just this, Ruth is this beautiful picture of someone who sows good seed and reaps a good harvest. And it happens with, in Moab with her relationship with Naomi. And it happens even as she's interacting with Boaz in the field. And she walks away with that big, that big pile of grain at the end of the day. She reaps in the present what she sowed in the past. Ruth's faithfulness positions her for blessing. Just by doing what she's supposed to do, she's positioned for blessing. But, but, it's, but it's Naomi that looks and sees there's more going on here than just an older gentleman being nice to a younger woman, appropriately nice to a younger woman. She sees the potential for something much bigger, much grander than just a place to get some food. And so she's going to, as she does in chapter 3, she's going to advise uh, Ruth to take this idea of positioning to a whole new level. So instead of just being about your business and being faithful, she's now going to place her specifically where Boaz will find her. And Naomi is preparing Ruth effectively, essentially, to present herself to Boaz as a potential wife, which is a little unusual. There's two kinds of positioning in the kingdom. The first one is this this idea of when we're just going about our lives, doing what we know to do in any given moment. When we're serving the Lord, you're, you, know, you, you know what the word says, you're, 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 tr- you're reading your Bible, you're, you're, you're in fellowship, you're worshiping, you're, just, you're, you're doing the things that you know to do any given moment just to be faithful to the Lord. You know, you're, you're doing the things he says to do, you're avoiding the things he says not to do, but you're just going about your life. That's Ruth in the beginning part of this book. She's just going about her life, doing the things that she knows to do. She's not trying to get anybody's attention, she's not, she's not, she's not trying to, to draw anybody's attention, but rather the Lord's seeing her because she's being faithful and obedient. And that's true for us too. And I want to say this to you this morning, specifically about this idea of being seen. Some of you have spent your whole lives feeling like you're not seen, like you're not important, like, you, like, like you, people see you, but they don't see you. Does that make sense? They look at you, but they don't really know your depth. They don't know your importance. They don't know your significance. They don't know that you, what you bring. They just see you as someone in passing. You're not important. And I want you to say to say you this morning that this picture of Ruth being out in the field doing her gleaning thing and Boaz seeing her and asking questions is a beautiful picture of how God looks at us. The Lord is always seeing all of the details of your life. The stuff that you feel like nobody sees that, that I'm not important. I want you to know this morning, the Lord, just like Boaz sees Ruth, he sees you and you matter to him. The prophet said to King Asa, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose hearts are blameless towards him. The Lord sees you. Turn to the person next to you and say, the Lord sees you. I mean, his eye is on the sparrow, right? So you know he's watching you. That's the way that works. Write this down if you would. Every day, positioning comes from a lifestyle of obedience when we live our lives just going along going about our business seeking to honor God seeking to be faithful seeking to be obedient walking in the ways of faith and faithfulness when we're doing that the Lord sees us and that positions us for his blessing period it's the incidental you're not thinking about it you're not even realizing it's happened but he's constantly blessing our lives because we are just walking in his ways that is one kind of positioning but there is another kind of positioning And in that positioning, the second kind of positioning, it's when we come and we place ourselves at God's leading in a position where he can bless us in an amazing and large way. 
That's what we see in the second, the second part of the story. When Naomi tells Ruth, go do this stuff, she is putting herself out there on a limb. She is taking a, a courageous step. It probably looked and sounded a little bit strange, even to Ruth and Naomi, for her to do this. She is, make, she is being the, the uh, uh, she's not being aggressive, she's being assertive. She's stepping into a position where she's offering herself to a man in a holy and righteous way, but she's actually going against what would be the norm. She's trying to, to start a relationship with this guy. It was more forceful, it was more courageous, it was more bold. Write this down if you would. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, for us, sometimes the Holy Spirit, like Ruth, will position us to act in bold faith. And it will look strange. It will look a little bit weird. It'll look a little bit out there. But when you hear the Lord speak, when you hear the Lord tell you to do something, and you know in your heart, you know confirmed from the word, but you know in your heart that God has told you to do something no matter what it looks like, you gotta do it. You gotta step out there and be bold. In, in, in uh, Ruth and Naomi's case, this is indirectly Ruth didn't hear from the Lord. Ruth heard from Naomi who heard from the Lord. Naomi gets this revelation. Oh my goodness, I can see what's happening. She's working in the field. He's one of our redeemers. Go get dressed, go get ready. We gotta make this thing happen. And Ruth is just submitted to the situation and submitted to this lady Naomi and says, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna follow. And God moves in a powerful way. This kind of thing happens in scripture all time the time. Turn to the person next to you and say, it happens in scripture all the time. If you look for it, th this idea that there's these, these, these moments, and they don't happen all the time, but these moments where somebody is told by the Lord to do something wildly outside of, of the norm, because God wants to do something amazing. It, it's all over the scriptures. For, for Ruth, it's going up and, and waiting till midnight, sneaking up on this older gentleman and uncovering his feet. It's a wild story, but it's all through the scriptures. Think about this. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a, each of those three gospels tells a story of a lady who has an issue of blood. That she's been, she has been um, bleeding for years. She's weakened. She's infirmed. She, the, one of the, I think it's Mark says that she'd spent all of her money. She has no money left because she's trying to get doctors to help her. She can't get help. And she knows, can I say it this way? She like knows in her knower. She like knows in the deepest part of her spirit, I'm supposed to go and, and connect with Jesus. And it says in the text, it even says, she says to herself, if I can even just touch the edge of his garment, like the end of his robe, I know I'm gonna be healed. Get the picture for a second. This lady who is in a weakened state physically, who has no means whatsoever, who is unclean by the, by the biblical standard of cleanliness, works her way through a crowd of people. Swarm, remember what Peter says? You know, Jesus says, somebody touch me. And Peter's like, yeah, right. Everybody here is touching you. What's the big deal? Because there's so many people that this lady somehow, and I think she ends up down on the ground because she touches the edge of his garment. She is fighting her way on hands and feet to get to Jesus to be able to touch his, his clothing. That's weird. But she knew in the deep place of her spirit she was supposed to do it. And when she acted in faith, a miracle took place. It happens all the time. Luke chapter 19 is the story of Zacchaeus, a man of minimal height. And he wants to see, what are y'all laughing about that? I didn't even make a joke about that. I'm just saying, I mean, he is one of my favorite characters in scripture, but it's because of his tree climbing ability. That's why I think he's amazing. It's not his height. I mean, you got Jericho. There's all these people lining the streets. Get the picture on both sides, lining the streets. He can't see. He's little. And he climbs up the tree. You know, you know the song, right? So he's up in the tree, and Jesus is walking along. And all that Zacchaeus wants is to see Jesus. And Jesus is walking along, and, and, and you know, I don't think we do justice to this story because it's, it's a parade, and Jesus is the main attraction. And he stops in the middle of the parade and looks up into a tree with all this other stuff going on, and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to have dinner at your place tonight. And a miracle takes place. But Zacchaeus knew something. I, there was something inside of him, compelling him, driving him. I want, I want to see the Lord. I want to touch the end of the garment. I'll go down to the, the threshing floor in the middle of the night, all done up, and uncover this guy's feet. It's something that's unusual. But when you hear from the Lord, when you know in your spirit that God has spoken to you, it's been confirmed by his word, 
That kind of bold faith produces extraordinary results. Let me say this again. I've said it like 10 times, but let me say it again. That bold faith has to be, has to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Especially for us charismatic Pentecostal people. Because there are some of us who will just try to force something to happen by getting outside of the, the boundaries of what's normative. Oh, I mean, if God works in odd ways, I'll act, God, I'll act oddly so that God will work. That doesn't, that's not how it works. That's not the system. You hear from the Lord, then you act. But when you hear from the Lord, you don't let anything keep you from acting. Like Ruth, like the lady with the issue of blood, like Zacchaeus. We don't just do weird things to attempt to get God to do something. Remember, when, when Peter was in the boat and Jesus was walking on the water, Peter didn't just jump over the side. Peter asked to come, and the Lord said, come on out. That's why it worked. Not because Peter says, I'm doing that too, and just did it on his own. It's never that. It's always the prompting. It's the voice of the Lord that sets up the extraordinary faith and extraordinary results. Two kinds of positioning. One of the positions is this kind of un, uh, this unpretentious, consistent, day in and day out, I'm going to be obedient, I'm going to be faithful, and I know God is watching me and he's blessing me. The other kind is this bold, once in a while, I think I hear the Lord, I, yes, I know I've heard the Lord, I'm going to step out and be courageous, and God's going to do something amazing. The threshing floor was the ladder for Ruth. And, and I don't think these, these moments happen all the time. They happen occasionally, but their impact, if we will be obedient, like Ruth was, the impact echoes through the years and the generations when these big ones take place. When was the last time you had a moment like Ruth does in Ruth chapter 3? When was the last time you had a Zacchaeus moment? When was the last time you... He said, I know I'm supposed to touch that garment. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to crawl on my hands and knees to get there because I know God has spoken. When was the last time that happened to you? That you boldly positioned yourself at the leading of the Spirit for God to do something amazing. For me and, and for Susan, for both of us, I would say it's just probably a small handful of times in our lives that we have heard the Lord speak in a way that didn't make any sense, but we know we were supposed to do it. The one that comes to mind most readily in this season of our life is moving to Missouri. I mean, I love Missouri. I can tell you without any hesitation that Missouri was not on my map two years ago at all. You ever see those movies where they're the submarine and then they got that thing that goes like this and the little dots are the, you know, the things that are out there? When you, when you look at ours two years ago, Missouri's not on our little screen at all. I don't know anybody in Missouri, but it wouldn't go away. The Holy Spirit's saying, this is what you're supposed to do. And so we stepped out in faith and we are, I can't tell you how excited and happy we are to be here. This was of the Lord. Here's the thing. If the Lord speaks to your heart, like he spoke to Ruth, like he spoke to Susan and I, and it's a big thing like that, and it's an unusual thing, it's wild, it's outside of the norm. If he speaks to your heart and you're obedient, you will never regret stepping out, ever. Ever. Never, ever, 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 ever. When you hear him and you say, I'm doing it. I don't care. I don't care what this looks like. I know this is nuts. I'm just going to do it. You will never, ever be sorry if you're hearing the Lord. The Lord will lead you into something. And I, I just want to caution you because some of you are thinking, well, I've got this thing that's coming and it won't go away. Praise the Lord for that. Let me just caution you with one little bit of reality. There is no promise that it's going to be easy or that it's going to be predictable. It doesn't necessarily work the way that you think it will. I am a planner by nature. I want to have it all mapped out in my brain. And the Lord delights. I think when he sees me thinking that, he goes, Tim, buddy. Well, you were pretty close, but because you think you know, I'm going to do it this way. Just, so that, just to mess me up, you know, because he doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to just trust him and let him figure out the way that it's all going to work. It, he won't, it won't be easy. It won't be predictable. But I also can tell you this. It will never be boring. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and they may have it to the full, have it abundantly. This thing that we get to do with him is amazingly 
interesting and fun and joyful and peaceful, but it is never easy and it is never predictable. Can you, can you imagine Ruth getting married? She's here in Moab. She's getting married. She meets this nice, good-looking Hebrew named Malon. Can you imagine that she knew from that point I'm thinking what will happen is I'll become a young widow. I'll move back to Israel. I'll work for a while. Some older guy will see me. And I'll present myself to him as a potential wife. We'll get married. We'll actually have children. One of them will become the greatest king in Israel's history. And then probably the Messiah will come and save the whole world. <laughs> not happening. It's not the way it works. And you can't imagine the future that he has in store for you either. That's why we just trust him. Lord, take us on an adventure. Because if you're holding our hand, it's going to be good. Even if it isn't what we can imagine. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, you have invited us into a future of adventure. Trusting you, hearing that whisper, knowing that you're telling us to do something, Lord. You're inviting us, you're inviting us to take bold faith positioning action. And Lord, you're, thank God, you're not a risk. Thank you, Lord. You're not a respecter of persons. You don't do amazing things for people like Zacchaeus or, or Ruth or Boaz. And say that that's reserved for the people who are really spiritual and really on it. Lord, you invite all of us to walk with you, trusting you, listening to you, responding to you. So that we might have incredible stories that echo through the generations. Because extraordinary faith leaves extraordinary results. Lord, you're inviting us to do that. And my prayer for us is this. That as we are walking day by day, just being faithful, just doing what we know to do as we are walking day by day and positioning ourselves for your blessing, that we would have ears that are always open for the big one, for that thing that you drop into our hearts, you drop into our spirits that says, you need to, you need to go do this thing. And that we, even though it looks strange and even though it's out of character and even though it's totally wild, we are willing to say, yes, Lord. Kind of like Samuel. <laughs> we say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, may we be those people. May this church be a place where people are inspired to trust you with the big things and to step out with boldness. May we cheerlead each other, Lord, as we, as we see, hear each other's stories and we, as we understand that God is moving us and sending us and calling us to new and better things. Lord, may that be the culture of this place. Help us to trust you, Lord. Even though we can't see the end, help us to be willing to take the adventure holding your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you extend your hands as if you were going to receive a gift? I want to speak a gift to you and over you. May the Lord bind up your broken heart. Grace, church, family, and friends, may he give you freedom from captivity. May he give you release from the darkness. May he comfort you. May he give you a, a beauty, a crown of beauty instead of ashes. May he give you the oil of gladness instead of mourning. May he give you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness or despair. So that you may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You are oaks of of righteousness. Receive that. The Lord speaks over you and blesses you. You are oaks, solid and strong and true. Receive this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.